Um, Simon, thank you very much for that. I think the, um, the comment was that we cost England 45 billion, which was being handed to the Scots. Still an exaggeration, but never mind. Um, I'm going to start with three lessons from Scotland's referendum and then uh, go a little wider in terms of British politics, the next election, and some underlying thoughts as to what's going on. Three lessons. Firstly, the issue isn't going to go away. A 10-point margin, no over yes, in my view, was not wide enough to kill the issue for 20 or 30 years. Um, I don't know whether there'll be another referendum in five or 10 years' time, but the agitation for another referendum, I'm sure, will come back sooner rather than later. Secondly, and I resort to a cliché here, and it's a cliché because it is so often true, it was the economy, stupid, that in the end determined the result. When we did that um, famous or notorious Sunday Times poll um, with 10 days to go, we found that the pessimism about what an independent Scotland would be like economically, that pessimism had largely gone away and people were therefore prepared to vote yes. And then in the final 10 days, partly because of the reaction and response of the politicians, partly because of what I guess a number of you in this hall did in terms of banking and retailing and business, saying, look, this could be very bad news. This turned Scots away from um, independence in terms of economic prospects and no went back into the lead and won. But thirdly, and this is where I think we start to draw wider lessons, the Labour Party in particular, I think, paid the price of decades of, of, of arrogance, of, of neglecting its own base in Scotland. If you looked at where the yes vote was strongest, it was in Glasgow and Dundee, two traditional Labour cities. And it was clear from our polling that something like a third of Labour supporters, Labour voters, in the end, voted for independence. Um, and in my judgment, um, the reason why the, the core reason why the referendum in the end was relatively close was because Labour failed to convince uh, the great majority of its voters to vote against independence. And I think the lesson, the broader lesson, um, is one to do with politics in Britain as a whole, and I will argue also to do with business in Britain as a whole. Let me move on from this then to the prospects for the next general election next May, just seven months away. And I start with the threat uh, of the SNP to Labour in, in Scotland. Because what has been happening for the last 15 years in Scotland is the SNP has done well and progressively better in Scottish elections 45% in the Holyrood elections three years ago, but has done very badly in UK general elections. So a year before it won Holyrood, it got just under 20% of the vote in the general election and won just six seats. And that's because um, voters in Scotland at a general election were deciding on a choice of a UK government. Now, I think next spring, it could be different. The SNP will be say to voters in Scotland, Vote SNP to hold London's feet to the fire on future powers for Edinburgh. And I think it will get quite a big response. And the underlying weakness of Labour may cost Labour a number of seats. Labour, four years ago, won 41 seats in Scotland to SNP's six. So you can see, if the SNP puts forward a, a, an appeal that people regard as relevant in a general election, you could see the SNP taking a number of seats off Labour. So that's one of the uncertainties next spring. Two others. UKIP in England. Until two or three months ago, I would have predicted that UKIP would win either no seats or possibly one or two. We've now had two Conservative MPs defecting, one Douglas Carswell fighting a by-election next week, which I'm sure he'll win. Mark Reckless um, in Rochester, I think also probably win his 
by-election. More to the point, UKIP are getting this steady stream of publicity, which I think will add to its credibility. And I think there's now not a likelihood, but a real possibility that UKIP will win four, five, six, maybe if they do really well, as many as 10 seats at next year's general election. And they will also potentially have a big impact in seats which they can't possibly win. Um, Conservative Labour marginals, where UKIP, if they do well nationally, might draw votes away from the Conservatives that they need to hold on to those seats from Labour, or if they do badly, will help the Conservatives hold on to those seats. As, as David Cameron um, said, and we'll hear a lot more in this vein over the next few months, David Cameron said in his Conservative speech, you may go to bed with Nigel Farage on election night and wake up with Ed Miliband, so the Conservatives will plainly do all they can to pull those Tory-inclined UKIP voters back. The third unknown is whether the Liberal Democrats will stay in the same dreadful state they are now, 6% according to our poll last night, or whether they'll recover either nationally and or in the seats that they are defending. Bring those three things together. There will be very little switching next May between Labour and Conservative, and we will see those figures, which are statistically useful, swings Labour to Conservative or Conservative to Labour. But the reality is that this is one of those elections when it's not Labour going to Tory or Tory going to Labour. It's what happens to the SNP, it's what happens to UK, what happens to the Liberal Democrats. And at the moment, I'm not sure I can tell you with certainty how any, let alone all of those three contests are going to work out. And therefore, I can't tell you who's going to be the larger party. But I will say two things. The first is that I would be surprised if either Labour or the Conservatives win outright. They get to the 326 seats. They need to have an overall majority. And secondly, um, and this is something which I think the political establishment are just beginning to realise, it is quite possible there will not even be enough MPs to create either a Conservative Liberal coalition or a Labour Liberal coalition. It may be quite a messy outcome. And the technical point, um, and either take this on trust or go away and work it out on a piece of paper to prove it to yourselves, is that as long as there are more Liberal Democrat MPs than all the other minor groups, nationalists, Northern Ireland, Green, UKIP, whatever, as long as the Liberal Democrats outnumber all the rest, there will always be a major party Liberal coalition available in terms of the arithmetic. But if, as I think is quite possible, the Liberals are, let us say, down to 30, and you add the SNP, UKIP, Plaid Cymru, Ulster, Greens, they could be 35, 40, maybe even 50 or 60 seats. If the Liberals are smaller than them, then there's a real possibility that both Conservative plus Liberal Democrat will fall short and Labour plus Liberal Democrat will fall short. So um, in terms of the business world and your desire for certainty, I've got bad news that I can't even promise you that there will be a clear two-party coalition um, after next May. But I think there's a much more fundamental issue, um, which is why we're seeing this steady erosion of the old political certainties, originally that either Labour or Conservative would have a clear majority and perhaps more recently that Labour plus Liberal or Conservative plus Liberal would have a clear majority. And this is that the establishment parties have been in decline, the insurgent parties have been on the rise, and of course the Liberal Democrats were doing well as an insurgent party and are now doing badly because they've become an establishment party in the eyes of a great many voters. And there's something basic going on, and I think this does read across the business and indeed link up to what Susan was just saying a few minutes ago, which is that trust 
in politics is in decline. Now, you're all familiar with the story, um, whether you take the two big things of the last 10 years, the failure to find weapons of mass destruction in Iraq and, the, and, and how this damaged Labour and Tony Blair's reputation, and more recently, the expenses uh, scandal, which did huge damage. But let me tell you one more thing, which is perhaps less widely known. We at YouGov, we track the reputation of people with power, public power, private power. And the reputation of business leaders as a group has declined by roughly the same amount as the reputation of politicians. It also applies to civil servants and local government and the managers of local hospitals. There has, over the last 10 years, been a broadly based decline in the reputations of um, all forms of power and authority, private and public. So let me, um, as my final section, tell you what I advise politicians to do, because when I come to think about it, it's exactly the same advice as I would give you, and I think it ties in, as I say, with what Susan said. What I say to politicians is, of course you've got to get your policies right, just as if you're designing a new motor car, you've got to get the engine right and the alloys right and so on. But just as people on the whole don't buy cars because they've studied the construction of the engine, most people choose parties not because they take a detailed interest in policies, but for reasons that political scientists call valence. And the valence attributes are things like, is this party, is this leader trustworthy? Are they up to the job? Do they understand people like me? Are they self-serving or public-spirited? And it strikes me that successful businesses, just like successful politicians and parties, are those that have good answers to those questions. And therefore, if you take Susan's advice, you're well on the way to the valence victory, or if you like, the brand reputation victory that you need to grow and make profits. But if businesses are judged on the basis of stories about zero-hour contracts for insecure staff or, or bad pay of cleaners or bad treatment of people in China or Bangladesh that are making the shoes or clothes or whatever that they sell, if they're judged on stories about bonuses which appear unforgivable or tax arrangements that appear antisocial and anti-spirited, then those play as the failure to find weapons of mass destruction or, or MPs' expenses play into the reputation of politics. So it brings me back full circle. Had Labour not been so arrogant in Scotland, had it not, if you like, lost the valent struggle over many years in Scotland, we would have had a much more decisive outcome to that referendum. So look at Scotland, look at business, look at your world, look at your appeal, take Susan's advice, and just as the politicians have to, you need to win the valence war. Thank you very much.